today on Let the Bible Speak. We need to be careful that we don't tear down walls that God has built, but we also need to make sure we're not rebuilding walls that God tore down. And good morning. Thank you for joining me for Let the Bible Speak. It's great to be with you today. Thank you for being part of our audience to study the Bible. Over the past several years, we've heard a lot about building and tearing down walls around the world. You may remember in 1987, President Ronald Reagan famously stood in West Berlin at the Brandenburg Gate and he challenged Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev to tear down the wall that had divided East and West Berlin since 1961. Well, in 1989, people began to cross over that wall, and by 1992, it had been demolished. And then there are some today interested in building walls. Some argue that the United States should build a wall along its border, arguing that such is necessary to preserve the security and prosperity of America. Well, let's leave that to the politicians to debate. Instead, what I'm concerned about today are walls that God has built. And when you look back through the Bible, Walls were very important. In ancient times, they were used to fortify and protect a city. A wall was erected around a city, and a gate would allow people in and out. Watchmen would be perched along the wall to scan the horizon for danger and warn the city leaders of any threat that approached. Well, spiritually, God is concerned about such walls around His kingdom. Revelation pictures the New Jerusalem as having a wall great and high around it, Revelation 21 and verse 12. A wall is certainly to exist now between the church and the world, that is, a wall of demarcation and distinction, as the people of God are told to be a holy people called out from the world and separated unto God. That was also the case in the Old Testament. The Scriptures picture the Jewish people as having a wall about them, separating them from all of the other nations of the world. That's because they were the covenant people of God. God chose them for service in His great plan. It would be through their seed that the Messiah would one day be born. Now, God wanted them to be careful to maintain moral, ethnic, and religious purity throughout their days as a nation and as His covenant people. Not so that they might look down upon the nations around them, but rather so that God could use them as a light to the other nations and as a channel of revelation and blessing to all of the other nations of the earth, as now is the case in Jesus Christ and in His universally available gospel. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says that that wall or fence that separated them from the Gentiles was the law that God exclusively gave to them through Moses. But as he argues throughout this chapter, we're not saved by keeping the law of Moses. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That law served its God-given purpose, but when it was fulfilled, it was taken out of the way, and mankind was then reconciled together and to God through Christ. Now this is what Paul is teaching them, beginning in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. Here Paul says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace." who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us." Now, how did God remove that wall? And what happened when He did so? And are men today trying to rebuild the wall that God tore down? That's an interesting question, and it'll be the theme of our study today after a song.
It's a dangerous thing to tear down walls that God builds, and it's also a serious matter to rebuild walls that God tore down. In fact, that's exactly what it seems men are doing today in religion. It seems that many want the wall that God built between the church and the world taken away, while at the same time they're eagerly taking their trowels and stones and mortar and building the very walls that God did decree to be torn down and taken out of the way. In Ephesians 2 and verse 14, Paul refers to one such wall as the middle wall of partition that had divided Jew from Gentile. What is he talking about? Well, some scholars say that Paul was referring to a literal wall that existed in the Jewish temple. It was a fence or partition that separated the court of the Gentiles from the rest of the temple that was restricted to Jews. Gentiles were forbidden to pass that point. That physical partition was representative of the spiritual division and even hostility that had developed between Jews and Gentiles. In Acts chapter 21 and verse 28, Paul himself created an uproar when he was accused of taking Trophimus beyond that wall, thus according to the Jews polluting the temple. And, and so some argued that Paul has reference to that wall here in Ephesians 2 and verse 14 when he says that God has broken down the wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. Well, perhaps there is a spiritual allusion to it, but the problem with that interpretation is that if it is speaking of the literal wall in the temple, it actually stood until the entire temple was destroyed, and that wasn't until at least eight years after Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus. Rather, Paul tells us what the middle wall refers to. He says in verse 15 that that wall was the enmity or hostility, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. In other words, the law of Moses. He goes on to imply that the Old Testament law created two groups of people. Now, how did it do that? Well, the law of Moses, you see, was not given to all of mankind. That's a, that's a common misunderstanding. The Ten Commandments were not given to all of mankind. The law of Moses was given to the people that Moses led, the Jewish nation, those of the Abrahamic covenant, those who were born of the seed of Abraham and were heir to the promises made to Abraham. Every other nation on earth was excluded. They were Gentiles according to the flesh. The word Gentile just simply means nations. And all of the other nations but the Jews were outside of that covenant. But Paul says the wall that divided the Jew and Gentile was torn down and it was taken out of the way. Thus, according to verse 15, making one new man or body instead of two. That means that today God's people are made up of people of every nation and tribe and not just those who are Abraham's children by physical birth. Now that was a difficult lesson, especially for the Jewish Christians of the first century to accept. They placed great confidence in the flesh, that is, in the fact that they had the blood of Abraham coursing through their veins. And the great tragedy was that they misunderstood this distinction that God had made at that time between them and the Gentiles. They were very careful to maintain that fleshly and national separation from other peoples, but they weren't so concerned about the moral and spiritual distinction. In Romans, the second chapter, in fact, Paul shows how they were just as great of sinners as were the Gentiles, but yet they boasted of their Abrahamic lineage. They may have been able to trace their physical line back to Abraham, but you see, they were not his children spiritually because they did not possess the faith and character that Abraham possessed. If they had, they would have rejected, or they would not have, I should say, would not have rejected the Word of God, crucified Jesus, and rejected the gospel preached by his apostles as they as a nation did. Paul is showing in Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, as he does in some of his other epistles, that there is now no difference in the eyes of God. That Christ, by his fulfilling the law in his life and death, had torn down the wall between Jews and Gentiles, and there is now one body made up of those who are redeemed by the blood of Christ through the kind of obedient faith that Abraham possessed. In, in fact, Paul tells us who the true children of Abraham are. Listen to him over in Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 26. Now he's writing to Gentiles converted to Christ here, and he says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you, listen now, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, 
for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. No longer was there to be delineation and hostility between the Jew and Gentile. In fact, the law was never intended to make the Jew despise and hate the Gentile, but it was rather God's way of using the Jewish people as channels of revelation and blessing to the Gentiles, to the whole world. God would give the lost human race a Messiah and a Redeemer from sin through the line of Abraham. And that's why God told Abraham when He repeated the promise to him in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's talking about the fact that through the lineage of Abraham, God would provide the world with a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So now listen again to Paul in Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 13. He says, But now in Christ Jesus ye who were sometimes far off, that is Gentiles, are made nigh, brought near by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace, Jews and Gentiles, who hath made both Jews and Gentiles one, how and where? in the church of Christ, the church of the Lord, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, that is, the law that delineated us, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, the Old Testament law that came by Moses to the Jews, for to make in Himself of twain, that is, out of two, one new man, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, so making peace and that He might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body, which is the church, Colossians 1.18, by or by the means of the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh, to Gentiles and to Jews. For through Him we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one Spirit, or through the revelation of the Spirit, the Gospel. We have access unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So Paul says the wall has come down. But yet even in Paul's own time, there were those who were trying to rebuild the wall that God tore down. And their efforts even continue today. Did you know that many religious beliefs and practices are in effect an effort to rebuild what God tore down and took out of the way? For example, there are those who still seek to make a national and racial distinction between peoples. For example, the whole doctrinal system known as dispensationalism, which is wildly popular and widely believed among many Protestant denominations today, among evangelicals, now, this doctrine makes such a distinction. They, for example, tell us that the church is a Gentile institution and the racial Jews, on the other hand, are still a covenant people with God today, but God has put His purpose for them on hold for a while. In other words, God has two programs. He has one for the Gentile, one for the Jew. And His plan for the Jews is delayed until later, and He's blessing the Gentiles presently. But that's not what Paul teaches here in Ephesians. Paul says he has made both one. When? Now. Where? In the church. The church's very beginning consisted of those Jews who kept their covenant with God and who believed upon and received the Messiah when He came. They were the beginning of the church. They believed the gospel when it was preached. They obeyed it and were added to the church beginning with the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Now again, Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 through 29, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. Not his seed by physical birth, you see, but by the new birth and heirs according to the promise. Friend, any person who makes any racial, ethnic, or national distinction between people doesn't understand the gospel. There's not a Jewish program and a Gentile program, a Jewish religion, a Gentile religion. There's the church of Jesus Christ, made up of all who have obeyed Christ in faith, in baptism, Jew, or Gentile. Also, the church is not an American institution nor is it a Roman institution. It's not a European institution. It is a heavenly institution, and that's it. 
God does not have a white church and black church and then a brown church and a yellow church or a red church. He only has the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. And consequently, any people who discriminates, hates, or looks down upon another person because of the country they were born in, the color of their skin, or their socioeconomic status, is a respecter of persons and commits sin, according to James chapter 2 and verse 9. Such thinking is completely opposite, antithetical to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, the religious division in the form of denominationalism and sectarianism that exists today is an affront to God, and it's an unwitting effort to rebuild the wall that God tore down. We're told today that denominations are simply an unavoidable fact of religious life. And in fact, some even suggest that the religious diversity that surrounds us is, it should be celebrated. We're led to believe that the church is made up of all kinds of varied beliefs and practices represented by distinct fellowships of Christians around the world. Now, my friend, that may be popular and that may have been the accepted norm for so long that we take it for granted and think of it as truth. But nothing is farther from the truth. And nothing is more contrary to the spirit of Christianity as Jesus Christ authored it and brought it into this world. Think about it. If Christ had built His church to consist of many sects and different denominations, wouldn't we immediately see that in the New Testament? Couldn't Christ have established a Jewish church and a Gentile church and avoided much of the conflict that arose in the first century due to brethren's immaturity and misunderstanding? In fact, some almost seem to treat the church as though it were divided into two branches, including the Apostle Peter, who was guilty of treating his Jewish and Gentile brethren in an inconsistent manner. You remember Paul had to rebuke him for it when he saw him in Antioch, according to Galatians 2 and verse 11. No, instead, Christ, according to Ephesians 2 and verse 16, reconciled both unto God in one body by the cross. And that's the will of Christ today, one body not Christians of this denomination and Christians of yet another denomination and still other Christians from another religious organization, such as unheard of in the New Testament. And it's contrary to what Jesus Christ placed in this world and desired for His church to be. What the gospel produces is simply Christians, nothing more, nothing less. Not kinds of Christians, Christians. Members of the church that Jesus established on the day of Pentecost, not built by some man in later times members of the church Jesus built, made thus by obedience to the gospel, being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, Galatians 3, verse 27, and thus added by Christ Himself unto that church, Acts 2, verses 41 and 47. May God help us to leave such an unscriptural concept behind and to seek to restore the faith that was once for all delivered and respect the fact that Christ tore down the wall of religious division in His death. And God forbid that we take our human creeds and doctrines and man-made names and various practices for which there is no Bible authority. And we thus take our trowels and our brick and our mortar and rebuild walls of division that God tore down in the death of His Son, Jesus Christ. Friend, I would lastly point out that men are rebuilding the wall that God tore down in Christ when they seek to observe the law of Moses today. Now we've been made free from that law, the Bible tells us. Listen to Paul in Galatians 2 beginning in verse 18. He says, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Well, what's he referring to? You see, the efforts of Judaizing Christians to go back and enforce the law of Moses on this side of the cross was causing great trouble in the first century church. And so Paul confronted that over and over again, particularly in his Galatian letter. Now you say, is anyone doing that today? Are there modern Judaizers all around us? All around us. They may not be trying to bind circumcision, but they're trying to bind other things from the law and they're trying to justify other practices by the standard of the law instead of the authority of Jesus under the new covenant. Sabbath keeping, instrumental music and worship, 
a special priesthood distinct from the rest of the body, uh, a distinction between clergy and laity, the burning of incense, the keeping of Old Testament days and feasts. Friend, if your pattern for worship and church organization comes from the Old Testament and the Old Temple, your worship is not in spirit and in truth. If you have to point to an Old Testament scripture to justify something that you offer to worship as uh, you offer to God as worship today, you're going back to the law. And you're helping rebuild a wall that God tore down in Jesus Christ. Ironically, many of us agree that it's wrong to try to be saved by keeping the Old Testament law. Most of us acknowledge that Christ is sufficient for our salvation and that we're only saved by grace through obedient faith in Him. We recoil at the idea that our justification depends on being circumcised or offering animal sacrifices or keeping Jewish holy days and customs. And we would think it very strange if someone today went back and began offering animal sacrifices as commanded under the law. We would think it very odd if someone were to try to build a tabernacle or a temple such as what we read about in the Old Testament. But yet many will still look to Moses as their authority for what they practice in the church and in religion today, their pattern. Or look to the Old Covenant Jews and their temple practices and their types of worship as justification for the things that are commonly practiced in religion today. But we can't have it both ways. If the law of Moses was taken out of the way because it could not save, was never intended to save, and if Jesus is the only way we can be justified, then Jesus is also our sole authority in the church today. God made that clear in the great scene of the transfiguration. Jesus is the head of His church, not Moses, not David, not the high priests of that dispensation, but Jesus and Jesus only. Christ said after His death and resurrection before returning to heaven, all power, that means authority, all power in heaven and in earth has been given unto me, Matthew 28 and verse 18. And when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration, and Moses and Elijah appeared before them, God made the form of Jesus to shine and spoke out of the glory, saying what? This is my beloved Son, hear ye Him. And to go back to Moses is to rebuild a wall that God tore down. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. God may have chosen and used a nation long ago to unfold His plan, but I'm thankful that that plan includes all of us who are willing to place our faith in Jesus Christ and to claim Him in obedience as our Savior, our Lord, and our King. If you would like to obey the gospel today, if you would like to become part of the family of God, through faith in Christ, we'd be delighted to assist you in obedience to the truth in becoming a New Testament Christian. If you'd like a copy of our lesson today, simply contact us and ask for the lesson, Rebuilding Walls That God Tore Down. 
and we will send you that free copy as soon as we're able to. We appreciate you for joining us today for Let the Bible Speak. We hope that you'll tell others about our program and make your plans to be back here next week if the Lord wills for another Bible study together. In the meantime, find us online at ltbstv.org and on social media. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which continues to grow along with our Facebook page. Just search for Let the Bible Speak TV. Have a great week ahead. If the Lord wills, I'll see you next time. Until then, God bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.